Fritzy, Eve, and myself are actually, we just found out last week, we are going to be speaking at the International Builder Show. So mm -hmm. we're very excited. Next month, we're going to be speaking on universal design and aging in place and unlocking the puzzle pieces to well, the house. February. Yeah. Yeah. In February. So it's coming yeah. up. It's going to be huge. So um, that's live and in person. So we will be flying out to go do that. But I just, without further ado, Fritzy, please take <laughs> it away. Uh, well, thank you so much. I feel like that was a bit of the fangirl introduction there, I will tell you. So um, I am very grateful to be here. I actually was a speaker uh, one August, I think it was two Augusts ago when EXP did their senior month celebrations. So many of you may have already seen me um, a couple of years ago. And I don't know that I could really hold you to actually remembering what I said. So we're gonna try something new today. I'm going to share my screen and we are going to get into this presentation and the um, <laughs> slideshow, here we go. All righty, so can you see my screen full? Home Design for Aging in Place, August, are we good? Yes. Okay, all righty. So again, thank you very much to Heather and Eve for this opportunity to spend some time with you this afternoon or evening, depending on where you are in the country. Um, just one quick note on the housekeeping side from my point of view, uh, you are welcome to interrupt me, but I know Eve and Heather have a chat protocol and questions. So I think if you have ideas that come up um, and you want to put them into chat or just make a note when we get to that part of the presentation, um, just make sure you ask any questions that you have and I will, I'll do my best. Yeah, we'll ask that you put it in the chat box. We'll go ahead and answer them to our best of knowledge. And then we are going to open it up for a live question and answer the last 10 to 15 minutes. So please go okay. ahead and save those questions so she can answer them. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you. All righty. So just in case you had no idea who I was, I wore the same blue sweater as my headshot today. Um, so I am Fritzi Grodion. I've had an opportunity to be an instructor in the Certified Aging in Place Specialist space since 2015. And yes, we do update the curriculum. Uh, so that's been uh, a big piece of my ability to share information in this aging in place space. And I am co-founder of Age Safe America as well. So Heather was referring to the first of the books that I wrote, which was Grace and Grit, Insights into the Real Life Challenges of Aging for Adult Children and Their Parents. Title way too long, learned that lesson as a first time author. Um, but my experience for the last 10 years I was in New York and you will hear the Long Island come out as we get into the conversation probably. Um, but I did environmental work for 22 years. And at the end of that time, I added a company with doing senior move management. And you know, now it's an industry. Uh, in 2001, when I started, it was not. Uh, when I left New York in 12, the manager of my company took it over and she and her husband are still operating that business today. So I am honored about that. But the book really talks about the different generational perspectives on moving later in life. And the, the last chapter is about my mom and her decision to age in place, which now has become my encore career as well. That's probably way too much about me. <laughs> all righty aging in place what is it we are all doing it environmental gerontologists tell us that our home is not just a physical structure our home is the sum of the patterns that we create in living 
So it's our comings and goings. It's our social networks. It's our community connections. It is all of those pieces that create what is home for us. And it is our, for the, for most of us, we are blessed that it is also our safe and secure space. So we have, especially having gone through the COVID years now and seeing what that is like and understanding that that element around our home and, and the safety inside our homes is, is as vital to us now as it ever has been. So aging in place is what we are really all doing. Every day we wake up, um, I, I have another little phrase like, today your toaster is one day older, right? <laughs> so if your toaster is one day older, then everything else is. And today we're going to look at some ideas around this whole aging in place concept, some of the language that you're starting to hear and more publications where consumers are starting to see the language in a way that has kind of been hidden to designers, to builders, to remodelers, to real estate agents who've understood this in the past, right? Um, so now we're starting to look at who is interested in aging in place and why. So where do we age in place? Um, we age in place in the home of our choice. So that can be a single family home. It can be a multi-generational home. It can be the ADU behind the big house, the accessory dwelling unit or casita. And then there are other places that we could be living besides our own home. So we could be living in independent living in a continuing care community. Uh, we could be living in an assisted living community or a small board and care, or the fact of the matter is we could be living in skilled nursing. Any one of these places and can have some control for what we want to, in our aging in place environment, much more so when we're living independently and we're living in the single family multi-generational home environment. But we really are aging in place no matter what place we are. When do we start to think about aging in place? Typically it is a trigger event. So the trigger event, and oftentimes it is health related. So it can be the fall, it can be an injury. The trigger event also doesn't have to happen to us. We can see a trigger event with a friend of ours, with a business associate, with a family member. And that will also prompt us to begin to think about, okay, that's going on with them. I'm, I'm witnessing that. What can I do, A, to help them make choices that allow them to be safer in their space, but then reflect back on what else can I do for myself? What can I do for myself now that will allow me to just continue to be independent, living at home and living the life that I choose. So again, the trigger events can be uh, personal, they can be family events, or they can be observed in other colleagues or um, associates as well. Or frankly, we read about all kinds of crazy things that have happened in the press, right? A lot of famous people have taken falls that you know, resulted in serious injuries. And those kinds of trigger events, although that person may seem famous, may seem far away, that does plant the seed for us. There was a recent study by Kitchen and Design News of 1300 designers and builders. And they found that 52% now of designers and builders are being asked about aging in place. 
so that number for them is way up. I mean, it, it hasn't gone like a little geometric rise. It's exponential. People are starting to really engage you know, in that conversation. Fritzy, it's interesting you bring that up because I want to do, I want to give our viewers just a statistic. Less than 5% of our nation's housing units can actually accommodate somebody with a mobility issue. That means a walker or a wheelchair. So if somebody is a family member, anybody, and I'm going to, I probably am going to venture to say most of us are sandwich generation where we've got parents we're going to take care of and we've got our children still, but we're in between. We are going to end up being faced with a parent in a walker or a wheelchair. And how are they going to get around the house? And that's, I think, why we're seeing that spike in the design aspect of it. Because when you're talking about trigger events, it's kind of scary to think about our nation's housing units to be like that. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And we're going to touch on that a little bit. So you're making beautiful segues for me. Thank you, Heather. Yeah. And just so you folks know, she did not see the slides ahead of time. She's just spontaneously clever. Okay, here we go. Um, how we look at aging in place can be through a whole variety of design concepts. So there's universal design, adaptable, accessible design, visitable, livable. They all have their own characteristics and we could talk about those for at least another hour, but we're not going to. My point is we're going to address this vocabulary. Universal design is the design of a living environment. So that's typically our home, or it's also the public spaces in which we operate. That's accessible to all people, all ages, and all abilities. And we'll see some adaptations, some changes that are really designed in the universal design space. And this is a space where people who are planning and looking at their homes, or in the case of your clients, looking for their next home, these kinds of features in the house allow them to move in at any age, but then they're not having to make the modifications in the future. Or the modifications that they may make when they move in will last them through the balance of the time that they live there. Uh, and the other one that we'll probably see more of this afternoon is the visitable design. And that talks to Heather's point about um, access to the house, how easy it is to get in and move around, especially on the ground floor of the house. So we're going to, we're going to touch on all of these just a little bit. So the first of our considerations, uh, we're going to start outside. Um, I know that part of this, <laughs> I, was, I was asked to kind of take us through the house and look at some different parts of the house. So one of the things as we start to look at any house on any property, what is the general access to that house? And we're going to get into some more details. But how would the client or how does the existing client use that house? There are some homes where people never go in and out the front door, right? The only people in and out the front door is company, guests that come, or somebody trying to sell us a roofing deal. But the point is that we make these patterns. Like if we have an attached garage, do we always go in through the garage, right? The, even if the weather's nice. Who makes the whole trip outside the garage to then go in the front door? So the whole point is we want to look at all of the ways that we get into the house. And I've had some clients go through the garage out to a side door and then just go in the side door, right? Front doors for company. So as we're even just looking at what that pattern is, then the thresholds, what are the steps that we have to step over at the front doors? and whether or not there are any stairs at all. So there's a lot of considerations related to stairs and we'll touch on some more of those. 
for us also from the outside, when we're looking at these patterns, uh, we're looking at our doors and the locks. How easy is it, it? How easy is it to operate that handle on the door? Should we just have a lever handle to make it easy, right? Lift up, lift down. Um, the newest styles also unlatch if you push them. So something simple like the change of the front door handle can make it so much easier for anybody. And then it lasts as long as the door handle lasts, right? We don't have to change it again if, we, if our needs change. So we're looking at lighting on the, in the porch area over that door lock. Uh, we're also looking at lighting along the pathways outside. So that can be solar lighting, motion sensor lighting. How does it make, how is it easy for people to be able to take those paths that they do into the house and the lighting in the garage itself? Many of us have just the garage door opener light, you know, the, the two, one or two bulbs behind that square plastic thing up in the ceiling, right? But in the garage, there's typically a switched light as well. Oftentimes it's a single bulb. If you switch that out to a tri-light with LEDs, you can change that the light in that space hundreds of times just with the change of that one bulb. So looking at how our clients are using their spaces and where there are opportunities here because if we change the lighting in the garage, it's good for the client who lives there now, and it's good for the next, right? If they decide to sell. So this uh, slide just shows us two different pathways into a house. So this one has the walkway right up next to the house, some stairs, thank goodness they did put railings <laughs> in the diagram, right? And then this is a hardscape conversion, right? Up to the same step, but this is a gentle sloped walkway. And because the slope is, is like one to 20, so this is really just a walkway, all of the requirements for handrails, et cetera, don't apply. So this is a gentle enough slope. Now, of course, it would be nice if they put lights here along the path. Um, but this is just one way to change it. And there's, there's nothing about this new entrance that says someone is a wheeled user, right? It's just a lovely walkway from the driveway up to the front of the house. So we've got some other choices. Um, and this is another one where from the driveway, the driveway is just sloped up a little and the edge of the porch you can see from the angle is sloped down and this becomes the walkway up to the house. But there, it's, it's very seamless, right? There's nothing here that says this is a wheeled user. And this is, so this component right here, just changing this is a universal design. Now, some of our clients, if they've had some kind of an incident, right, an accident, then there may be a requirement for a temporary solution that could be brought to the house and then removed when they're when they're well, when they've you know gone through rehab, et cetera. Um, and again, these if this situation were to be in front of a client's home, then this is an opportunity for us to also use some landscaping and really make this work uh, for the client as well. So here's two more examples of integrated designs where the pathway up to the house is very straightforward. Um, this one was just done a couple of years ago in San Diego County where they actually created this concrete ramp that looks like a walk up to the house, right? And they had, they had just done this. So that's why the plantings are a little fresh here. Um, but again, it's a way to integrate the accessibility 
um, and visitability into the home design. <laughs> then of course, we have clients for which this is the real world um, and um, our opportunity to be able to help them come up with more creative and safer solutions. Um, but we also see integrated designs here. This is a patio area where a portion of it is a gentle ramp up and there's also stairs. So this accommodates anyone coming to visit and having access to that back porch. Remembering, and I stuck this one in, <laughs> this is my safety tip is non-slip surfaces. So when you are, have anybody with stairs outside, inside, just check. And I'm really hoping by the end of our conversation today that there will be some new things that you start to watch for as you're working with clients. And so non-slip is one of them and it comes in lots of forms. It strips, tape, visibility, carpeted on wooden stairs. We have lots of choices, but it is an important thing to keep in mind. So I stuck that one in. <laughs> All right, we're still outside and we're looking at lighting. So having enough lighting for our pathways is gonna be critical. And this works, they can be uh, motion activated, they can be solar lights, they can be switched, lots and lots of choices, but it enhances the exterior. So I think curb appeal is the term that, that you folks use, right? This is just one more feature that's already there. So this helps the clients that are living there now. And it adds because we have plenty of light here over the garage, along the pathway, up to the house and the light over the porch. So lots of different choices and products available from different manufacturers for lighting systems, including some that um, are motion activated for the entire length of the path. So some motion activated lights go on when you go by them and others will, you step on the first, you put your first foot onto this pathway and then on this pathway and then all of them would light up at once. So lots of different kinds of systems that are available for clients. And motion sensor lights. So this is just a few of the exterior options um, that we have. Motion sensor lights, again, I don't know how many favorites I can have, but motion sensors is right up there. Um, a lot of times when we know that a motion sensor would make a difference, even when somebody's coming into the room, there are motion sensor light bulbs now. So if someone doesn't want to change their table lamp, you just put in a motion sensor bulb and when they walk in the table lamp, their favorite table lamp will light up. So that's it, right? Then they've got to click it to make it stay on. I, I'd have to confess that part. But the idea is that we can use some really simple things to really make that difference. So again, motion sensor lights, and you'll probably hear me talk about them again as we go on. This particular light at the bottom is a style, and I know Sunbeam actually um, made a light like this that plugs in, so it's a motion sensor night light while it's plugged in, it's a soft glow. When the power goes out, if you lose power, it lights up and you can just pull it off its, its little, harness here and use it as a flashlight. But the whole idea is when you don't have power and it's dark, how many of us have tried to find the flashlight in the dark with the power out, right? How many of us have tried to find the candle and the matches years ago before I was a safety person, right? So at least this little flashlight, this little motion sensor nightlight lights itself up so we can see where it is and then use it as a flashlight. All right, here we go. 
So this, I'm just going to tie in our pathway discussion to the, the visitable design and the visitable design ideas, because again, this is the newer vocabulary that we're going to see in um, articles about houses. Um, there are in fact municipalities that will offer tax exemptions to the property for visitable design. There are some different grant programs depending on the part of the country you're in. And um, there are additional uh, um, grants for rural communities that uh, might be important if you have, uh, if that's your area with whom, if you're working with clients in a more rural area, there are some things that can help them access some funding to be able to do some of these things as well. So visitable design is simply the ability to get from wherever we are, just right up to the door and into the house easily. All righty. So we, here you go. You want to be toured through the house. We went, we came in the front door and we went right to the kitchen. <laughs> Why? Because it's the center of the home in many cases. That's one. And number two, we're probably bringing in the groceries. So the kitchen, we do a lot of things in our kitchens, right? We store, we prepare things, we cook, we serve, then we clean up. All of these activities are going on in the kitchen. So let's just take a look at some of the ways that we can enhance the kitchen. Oh, oops, I stuck in the real world. <laughs> All righty. I'm not even going to ask for a show of hands. Who has seen this kitchen? Okay. <laughs> Who has seen this kitchen more than once? Right. It's a fact of life. And we're going to just take a look at some opportunities first and foremost, right? Just clearing the counters, taking that deep breath, decluttering, and then maximizing our storage so that many of the items that are here could be stored out of the way and just give us those clean work surfaces. All right, so this um, is another, this is a kitchen island, but with the smooth cooktop, the way the cabinetry is located, you can open and if someone needed to use a wheelchair, they could actually roll under and cook at this cooktop. But when the doors are closed, right, there's, there's nothing that screams a wheelchair user is in this house, right? That's really what we're looking for is looking at some of the features that will make sense for us. So telescoping downdraft, that's here. People are this way and that way about that particular feature, but it allows us to have a cooktop in the island with a vent. And there's more kinds of venting systems. But the idea here is off the island, we also have a peninsula. So a lower seated area, right, for eating, uh, for prep if we want to. And we've got natural light. We've got lighting over, task lighting over this particular space. So it's a way to look at integrating some of these features as we're looking at kitchens as well. So this is another example. This one has some additional storage. Like, so this one has, again, the cupboards fold back. These are like bifold doors that are hinged and they fold back completely out of the way so that someone could wheel up to the sink um, and we've got pull-out surfaces here as well, um, relatively clean countertops, and we've got extra lighting. So we've got under cabinet lighting, and then we have general area lighting here. But we've got more pull-outs and opportunities to have that um, full access to the cabinets as well. Easy to open handles, Easy for everyone. Ah, the plate garage. <laughs> this is the plate garage is, is this little space here where you can stack the plates on their edge. 
it's a very special term. You all are going to look for plate garages now when you visit homes. All righty, other considerations in our kitchen. A full pull-out pantry shelves, right? They have refrigerators now that are the cabinet style. So they look like the cabinet. This one is another pantry here with uh, shelving on the door, pullouts, lots of ways to use these accessories to really make the space more usable, more comfortable. We're not trying to reach into things. We're not standing on the step stool, trying to get to the things on the top, right? Because we're able to pull those drawers out and pull them right out to ourselves. Um, this is an example of pull down from inside a cabinet. And there are different manufacturers for these kinds of systems as well. Um, oftentimes they'll be used in a kitchen to bring down like glasswares and coffee cups, those kinds of things down to make that part easier. But different systems that can be installed um, as well. Again, it's all about access for us and making sure that we can get to what we need to without uh, stress or doing anything unsafe like the step ladder. <laughs> Just saying. Um, automatic sensing faucets. Um, certainly the lever styles are easier, either a single lever um, or even for, for people who don't think they can control the temperature very well with a single lever, even just changing any knobbed handles to a style with little wings. So they still know they're turning hot or cold on. Now, if you've got uh, garbage disposal, you already have power under the sink. So touchless faucets also need power. So that's a consideration. You already have it if you have the uh, garbage disposal into the sink. So it's you're not having to add power for the touchless. And technology is going way out here, right? You can say, I don't wanna use her name, but it begins with an A um, because she'll answer. So, but you can ask her for, you know, one cup of water, one cup of cold water, et cetera. Um, again, those systems require, you know, good Wi-Fi in the house. That's the whole smart tech and where we're going on home that's a whole other conversation. But at least if we know that these are some considerations that make this space easier for everyone. Uh, Fritzi, yeah. if you have a dishwasher next to the sink, would that power also be good to use for a touchless faucet? It's uh, a question. If, oh, yeah. Um, you have to, you have to have, it's gonna be a GFCI outlet underneath. You just have to see if there's anything else because if you have a dishwasher um, and you don't have a garbage disposal, you may have one available. If you've got both, then that that's really an electrician or a plumber's question. Yep. But thank you for asking. <laughs> yeah, it, it really, you've got to kind of peek under there and see what you've got before you decide you're going to go that way. Um, task lighting. Again, this is inside our spaces. So we've got the kitchen example here with the lighting over the sink area and the island area, uh, under cabinet lighting, also in prep areas and with through in the living room here. So this is a reading corner. So the reading is the task. But the idea is we want to ensure that we have adequate lighting in all of the different spaces as we're considering what we're really doing in those spaces. All right, one more quick kitchen one. This is an older design, so please don't scrunch your noses, but the idea, I just wanted to show you this, these two stainless steel drawers, this is the refrigerator. So we have a refrigerator, freezer, a drawer style. Dishwashers can be drawer styles as well. Right, we've got the microwave on the counter as opposed to up overhead. And microwaves are also in drawers now as well. 
Um, this one also has a center island with a sink, a cooktop, and a lower surface for eating or prep, and lots of sources of light. So I'm just I just wanted to show you an, another idea with some features with you know wide aisles, smooth flooring, etc. Oh, the towel bar handrail, open spaces. This has multi-level level counters that's a little hard to see. Um, and, oops, and counter height shelving. So in many kitchens, we see the cabinets, we see a lot of uppers, and those basically can become inaccessible for our clients. So this was just a different style where they brought the cabinetry down to the counter height and used open shelving. Okay, bathrooms. What are we, our big considerations in the bathrooms? Certainly safety, right? Our bathrooms have hard surfaces, right? Sharp corners, water, soap, and people. <laughs> now you can't ask for a combination of five ingredients that aren't more set up for possible disasters, right? Hard surfaces, a one little dollop of hair conditioner on the bottom of the shower can send your foot slipping in a heartbeat, right? So safety is a big consideration for us in the bathroom. Also, as we're looking at the bathrooms and some different designs and what our clients may be looking for, right? We've got multiple users in the bathroom. Certainly privacy is important for us. And as we're seeing more and more multi-generational homes, so Eve, I mean, I'm sorry, Heather, you mentioned being the sandwich generation. I think multi-generational living is also gaining in its requirement for families. And so that's where, again, we've got more users, but also a greater requirement for some privacy. And in the bathroom, easy maintenance. Alrighty. So this is just some different photographs of some bathroom ideas. Here we have, this is a, a sink that's open underneath. So someone can use a walker or a wheelchair, just or, right, just walk up to it. We've got multiple sources of lighting, the, the cabinet, the mirrors, the extra mirrors as well. So being able to access that, um, the adjustable mirrors, this one has knee space. Let me just click through here. Um, so for this view, the pipes are protected behind um, an additional piece of cabinetry. So there's no view of the pipes that are back behind the sink, right? Um, Again, let me just kind of, um, all right. So we have our non-slip flooring and, oh, I gotta just move this over here. Um, and we've got the, the comfort height toilet, non-slip floor. All right, so these are some features. And again, aesthetically, this is as attractive as a bathroom, right? As we may find. Other considerations certainly are the curbless showers. And again, more people are choosing to do those. Uh, now the big spa showers, you just, you know, that you walk in and they're doing it at every age, not just a, you know, ju not just the um, aging in place kind of segments of folks, but throughout the generations, they're just choosing to have these shower spaces. Certainly, um, it's an opportunity for us to have the grab bars, the personal soapbox of mine, um, and a number of manufacturers now have designer lines. Um, some of them make antimicrobial bars. They make them in colors that are powder coated. Lots of choices to be able to incorporate that element of safety in the shower design. So this one, 
happens to be a shower system. Uh, this one has a very low threshold. You can get uh, the same shower systems with zero as well. Uh, many of the shower systems that we're looking at have different shower heads. So we've got a fixed shower head and then also the handheld so that people have a choice as to what they use. Um, this one happens to have a bench that folds up out of the way. And the visual clues for the soap and product niches. So they've just chosen to use this particular tile so that when you're in there, you know exactly where the products can be placed. So again, this is another view. This is a different style where we can see the roll under sink. This is the piping is underneath, multiple sources of light. This one also has movable storage. Some people are concerned that when they have a roll under sink that they don't have that vanity cabinet to store the 100,000 things that we do in the bathroom, right? So this is a way to be able to have that to give someone more access here, but still have access to all of their items. And in this photograph, we've actually got a front on um, a faucet here on the side as well. Just some different design ideas. So livable design, we're kind of back to that, that picture that I had before. Livable design takes the idea of visitability, which is the ability to get into and around the first floor of the home and expands it to make it a home that would be accessible for someone using a wheelchair to actually live in the home, which means there's an accessible bedroom with wide enough spaces uh, to move around uh, and a fully accessible bathroom. So that means the shower and bathing area also has to be um, accessible to them. So livable design is really the, the newest version of all of these design ideas that have been coming along. And for builders or remodelers interested in universal design, it's a voluntary certification that you can explore and then use that as um, a marketing tool for yourself, differentiating those spaces that you've created. Other things just briefly here, because um, are related to some of our innovative solutions for our clients at home. So certainly on the aging in place side, we do want to be conscious about the systems that we can use for alerts if there are medical challenges. So our voice activated systems, all of those other kinds of systems, medical alert, um, even the systems now that allow us to have telehealth conversations have our doctor's appointments, et cetera. Um, when we're, we're looking at the home design for the next set of, gener for the generations coming right behind the baby boomers and the younger baby boomers, having these uh, systems or the ability to incorporate those systems in the house, that's also increasing. The other thing that's increasing, and it's truly, I believe, part of our post-COVID world is biophilic design and wellness. So a lot of people are looking for those spaces or ways to create that biophilic means the outside inside. Um, so plants, we can see it in the use of color um, and the wellness spaces. And this is where we're going to see like the curbless walk-in showers that we know work for everybody of all age as part of that wellness spa sense as well. So we're gonna watch for more of the information about the integration of the biophilic design and this wellness space as well. All right, my quick summary. <laughs> The girls are going, she's going to be done. All right. Aging in place. We are all doing it. We're all doing it. We wake up every morning. We say, thank you. I'm alive. And I'm aging in place. When working with our clients, this is an opportunity now to ask the kinds of questions about their short-term and long-term goals, because that will 
help you provide even better choices for them in terms of looking at the housing and the homes that would be appropriate for them. So not just, and this this can be a hard conversation because some people may not be ready. They're just like, oh, I, you know, I'm, I'm looking for this. You know, I need a kitchen. I need a window over the kitchen sink. That's what I needed, right? I could buy any house as long as I had a window over the kitchen sink. Well, that's not a good exploration of my short-term and long-term goals. And I had to be able to do that kind of thinking, but please, um, consider exploring this as part of your conversation with your clients. And now that we have done a few of these stops in, around the house and a few stops inside the house, please take a, a look and see it's not just the throw rug in the hallway. It's not just the stack of books and the laundry on the stairs. There's lots of other things that we can do um, to help our clients and also to help them make the preparations in their homes for sale as well. All righty, questions? <laughs> I'll, throw out, I'll throw out one that was in the chat, or unless Heather, you want to throw that one no, out. No, 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 go for it. It's basically about the expense, uh, particularly it came after you were talking about the showers, and uh, they would like to know, is this conversion from traditional showers expensive? I mean, that it's a, I guess it's a wide range, right? But in general, is it more expensive to do something for aging in place than it would be to not consider the aging in place? Okay. Um, yes, the answer is, thank you, Eve. The answer is, it's all over, right? It's, you can, you can remodel your bathroom and put in fancy, fancy tile and, you know, $300 lights and $400 shower heads and all of that. So that it can get, really expensive for for clients though looking like at those like doing a bath system taking out a bathtub and putting in a shower that would work for them um those are less than five thousand dollars and in some places they're even less than three thousand dollars and it's designed to be done in one or two days so it it can be conversion to a, a simple shower system with its construction requirements all the way up to, you know, the house studies will tell us that, you know, people can spend a hundred thousand dollars in a bathroom if they choose to. I, you know, it's funny. So they could actually chip um, from Toronto brought up a great um, point is he said, you know, many people will remodel their bathrooms or their kitchens after their tenor. So it's easy um, um, and inexpensive to think about these features before you need them. He had a client that did his house um, after 75 years, but I think you know, it's going to, uh, to go back to this whole aging in place, I put in some statistics in the chat box for you guys. So you have them. So when you're out there talking to people, you can discuss this, but just put in perspective, 55% of fall injuries among older people occurs in the home. That, like, that's pretty big. I mean, when you really break it down, that's huge. But it, the additional 23% happens outside the home or, or outside the home, but near it. So when you're putting mm -hmm. into perspective, all of, you know, our nation's housing units, less than 5% can actually accommodate somebody with a mobility issue, walker or wheelchair. And by the way, if you want to test something out, go ahead and take a stroller with you. It's no different. <laughs> Take a stroller and go up somebody's driveway. And can you get in? Can you get through the door? Can you get into a bathroom with your stroller? Can you wheel the stroller around? It's, it's, I mean, it's a little smaller, but I got to tell you, it's no different. But I think going back to when you look at the statistics and what they're telling us, look at, we know that by 2034, those over to the age of 65 will outnumber those under the age of 19 for the first time in U.S. history. So we're going to outnumber those, the younger, the younger, the younger kids. But not only are we as an as a demographics aging, but we're living longer. We know the last 10 years we've doubled the amount of centenarians. I can only imagine mm -hmm. what the next 10 or 20 years is going to bring. Mm -hmm. So 
not only as a population, yes, we're getting older, but we're living longer than our ancestors did, but our nation's housing units is not changing. If you look at our nation's housing stock, our, a majority of our units are over 50 years old, over, heck, over 40 years old. I mean, it's not a lot of new build going on. There are laws that are trying to be passed. Um, I will tell you, Eve, myself, Fritzy, we are working on um, a law in Washington, D.C. to help homeowners, uh, any homeowner, get a tax exemption just for making aging in place modifications to their home. And I, as a real estate agent, I advocate for that universal design because I know that the younger generation could not only benefit from it, but they think it's cool. Like we need the technology as we get older in our homes, but the younger generation wants the technology because it's cool. So it's kind of a win-win when we're redoing the homes and then we're going to sell them. But I think more importantly, I kind of call this kind of air, area that we're working in is a modifier move effect. We're going to be forced to modify our homes after 40, 50 years to accommodate aging in place, or we're going to need to move. And like Fritzy said, aging in place doesn't necessarily mean the home that we're in right this moment. It's the home right. that we're going to be living in safely. Um, but just how do we get there? And I think as a real estate agent, um, it's our job to give our clients, and not just a real estate agent, but just in any profession when you're dealing with seniors, to give them all the opportunities, not just one or, or and help them. You know, once you take them out of their house, you've got to do something with them. You know, we got to do that. And I think that's why Fritzy was showing you all the different types of cares that are out there. But it's a huge world um for the senior sector and us on this zoom call are right there at the bottom of like it taking off because this niche is just and moving we've got, forward we've got a com another comment from chip that makes a really good point and additionally many of the features have other benefits like security comfort and convenience and i would also add you're going to save money in medical costs with this fall prevention these fall prevention uh, modifications that you're going to make. That's funny, so, actually, Chip. Thank you for saying that because actually they know statistically that aging in your home is much cheaper than actually having to end up being placed somewhere because you can't go home. And that's the, that's the issue is you aren't able to go home because you haven't made those little modifications or you haven't planned for something later down the line because you know that you want to be there. So. I highly recommend that if you want to get involved in your community, get involved, um, pay it forward and um, educate real estate, you know, educate other, you know, um, seniors in your area. Um, I just want to mention that if you, you're going to start noticing, and Fritzy did say you're going to start noticing designs and names of things, but you've got some big players in the game that are shifting everything towards the senior sector, Lowe's, they've got Lowe's livable home. They're coming in and doing, they're trying to do, you know, um, assessments and they have a whole aisle at Lowe's just for products for aging in place. You've got Best Buy, huge partner in the tech field when it comes to buying tech knowledge for the senior sector. Um, you have, who's the furniture oh, company? Boy. Pottery Barn. Pottery Barn. Pottery Barn is actually designing furniture for universal design accessibility furniture, beds, couches. So there's a lot of big names that you haven't heard yet, but you're hearing it here with Eve, Fritzy, and I that you have that are coming into this game, and it's just the beginning, guys. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. I just I know that that the statistics are really your space. Um, but just to give you one that you can use another time is by 2050, we will have over half a million people who are centenarians. So there will be between 600 and 700,000 Americans over the age of 100. Wow. And if we think about 
the people we have counted on to care for them, which is the generation behind, our caregiving force of spouses and grown children will be 75 and 80. And, and that's why I, I say to you, and you're going to start hearing this word, the sandwich generation. Mm -hmm. It's not boomer. It's not Gen X. It is a sandwich generation. That means that you and myself are either taking care of helping or what have you, our parents, and we have children, grandchildren, whether it's children at home or grandchildren in our lives, we have a gap where we've got people on both sides of us that we're going to try to care for, whether helping with, the, you know, our younger kids or helping with the adults, with our parents, but we're stuck in the middle. And so yeah. I just think it's education, 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 and pass it on. Yeah, make, making us all aware. I, I wanted to see if Jennifer still wanted to ask a question. She had her hand up. I just up wanted earlier. to put my contact up. There. And if you did, just, just hop on, um, unmute yourself. If not, we'll just move on. Okay. All right. Okay, so Fritzy, we are at time. I want to thank everybody on here. Uh, we had over 30 people just on the Zoom, and I can't, I don't know how many people live, but I just want to thank everybody. Next week, we yes. have Jennifer Pickett, the um one of the co co people of Co uh, yes, executive mm -hmm. director for the National Senior Move Managers Association. Um, we're going to talk about downsizing and senior move management. I can't wait to introduce her. She's really cool. Um, and she's got a lot of great little tidbits. Um, everybody that we're bringing in to give you guys information are national networks. So you can reach out to them and find somebody in your area. Just reach out. There's Fritzy's information. You can find her at Household Guardians. You can check out her website. Um, and if you're looking to get aging in place certified, she is an amazing mm -hmm. um, master educator and one of my go-to people. I really appreciate you, Fritzy, for coming and joining Thank us. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you for everything. And Morgan, who is on this, but she's behind the scenes doing all the tech for us. Thank you. We are indebted to you. Happy Seniors Month. Next week's our last class. Talk yep. to you guys. Thank you, everyone. Say hi to Jennifer for me. I will. I definitely will. <laughs>